Is the world really going to return to how it was before, before birth control, before women had the right to work? You want to return women to chattel. You want women to be like your wife, passed around town. I'm not going to take moral lectures from somebody who, for all intents and purposes, may as well have a fleshlight instead of a wife, who demeans and besmirches her honor. And when you were riding on Trump, now when you're, I guess you're not riding on guys anymore, because apparently you prayed away the case. He wants to murder everyone. He wants to kill all the blacks. Um, no. Welcome back to Rattlesnake TV, guys. In this video, we are going to watch an at times heated and at times hilarious debate between Milo Yiannopoulos, who has not been in the public square for years, and liberal streamer Destiny. The debate is about Christian nationalism. And just for a bit of context, it was about seven months ago, just after the Nashville shooting by the Transformer. So let's get into the first part where Milo gives quite a profound case for Christian nationalism with a few jousts at Destiny in there as well. I have to give you some credit for um, having the cojones to show up in Tennessee uh, barely a month after the bullet-ridden bodies of children have been buried as a sort of representative for a culture that did it and offering anything but condolences and sympathy. I think it's disgusting. I think it's shameful. How dare you? How dare you show up here offering anything but sympathy? It's outside the scope of our evening this evening to uh, prove or disprove the, the truth of Christianity or or, or Christ or whatever, um, but I'll, I'll make a few points. Um, there is no America without Christ. And the reason for that is that um, this is an intrinsically and fundamentally Christian nationalist uh, country by which we mean it's built into the architecture of the nation. There's no getting away from it. You can lie about it, you can pridefully uh, claim that, you know, oh, you can be good people without Christ, you can't. Um, you're just inheriting uh, a system of good and evil from the culture uh, in which you grew up which accords with the natural law. America was founded, as Adams told us, with a constitution that is wholly unsuited to the governance of anyone but a moral and religious people. Do you think that America uh, is comprised of a moral and religious people today? Obviously it is not. And what he meant specifically was Christianity because the way that America is set up outsources morality to Christianity. And without it, it doesn't work because jury trials don't work when people vote with race instead of conscience and truth. Guys, just a quick reminder to hit that like button if you're enjoying this video and getting value out of it, just to help a brother out a little bit. And also, if you're not subscribed to the channel, if you wanna be a part of the greatest community right here on God's Green Earth, then hit that subscribe button below. Do it! Just do it! Back to the clips. Everything in America presupposes the legal system the social system, the government, everything in America presupposes the existence of the Judeo-Christian God. Without that, it all comes tumbling down. And without that, it is coming tumbling down. And without that, we're not able to give people who have terrible uh, sicknesses and weaknesses and defects the help that they need. Instead, we hand them victimhood scripts and they shoot up schools, they shoot up uh, churches, whether they are young white guys on antidepressants or whether they're transgender people who are told that it's white Christians are responsible for all of, the, all of their uh, miseries. It is Christianity that keeps us nice to each other, that keeps us being good to one another. And if you toss it out, as happened in 1776 here, you have a really big problem on your hands because, and I'm gonna say something very radical and difficult to say in Tennessee of, of all places, there are freedoms afforded to Americans that are too radical and too great and too daring without the insulation of Christianity. The First and Second Amendments don't work unless everyone's Christian. They don't work and they're not working. They're not functioning. You can't give crazy atheists guns. You can't let shameless liars say whatever they want about other people in public without consequence. There's a sort of, um, there's a sort of unwritten rule that sits behind everything in America. And it is that these are all the things you get to do because we know that you can handle it. We know that you can be trusted with this because you love God, because you respect life, because you won't take other people's lives, because you'll keep your word. Without that, the First and Second Amendments become a sort of license to abuse one another or to kill one another. They become a license to lie. They become a license to murder. They become too much freedom.
because there is such a thing. And without an underpinning moral architecture, this country doesn't work. And it's not working. And since this country has fallen away from God, the Christian God, this country has begun to, begun to fall apart. And that's why all of this terrible shit is happening. That's why all the awful stuff on TV is going on. It's why you can no longer trust people to keep their words if you don't know them. It's why everybody keeps voting with their skin color or their sexuality or gender or whatever bollocks it is today. Because they're not unified under Christ. Because they're not one under Christ. Because they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter if you agree with the literal truth of Christianity or not. The founders did, and they made a country for people who did. And if you don't agree with that, or you don't like God, or you don't see why too much freedom is leading us all to hate and kill each other, and you don't appreciate that we should not only restore Christianity in culture, but require it in public life, you should go to Canada. You should go somewhere else where there's a moral architecture built into the law. But here, it doesn't work without God. And when you don't have him, when instead people replace prayer and the rituals of the church with antidepressants, with compound interest, with games and drink and drug and drugs and fornication, kind of thing he does with his wife, you know, offering her around town like she's common property. America doesn't work when we behave that way because we'll all just end up murdering each other. That's all. So, I mean, Milo makes some pretty strong points there. It makes me quite sympathetic towards Christian nationalism, if I'm honest. And it's an ideology that I'm familiar with, but I don't know too much about. So if you guys actually know anybody that you think would be a good guest on the channel that I should reach out to, to steal me in the case for Christian nationalism, then let me know below. And I know I have a lot of atheists that watch this channel. And as a former atheist myself, I understand the worldview. And even if you are an atheist, a staunch atheist, even if you reject the notion totally that there is an ineffable God as revealed in the Abrahamic scriptures. Surely you can still acknowledge that as our societies have become more and more atheist and have moved further and further away from God, the cultural decline has come with it. And the more I look into this phenomenon and the more I see how much immigration is absolutely destroying Europe. The more I understand that in order for a society to survive, we need to be united in some form of understanding of fundamental truth and values. And the evidence points to this in a big way, guys. And if you want to know more about this, then you can listen to my most recent podcast with Jens Heiker. And guys, if you didn't know, the podcasts are on Spotify. You can check out the Rattlesnake podcast there where you can listen to it audibly. And so back to the point, if you agree with the fact that we have to be united under some sort of form of fundamental truth and value, then the logical conclusion of that is that there necessarily must exist some form of moral hierarchy or a moral authority. Because if not, and if morality is just a human construct that is constantly in flux and that is just all relative, then you relinquish the right to say that anything is good or evil or to complain about any of the ills of our culture. Because according to your logic, or as Richard Dawkins would put it, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind pitiless indifference. So then if you reject that notion that Dawkins puts forward as I do, then you must ask yourself, where should we derive our moral framework? Liberal atheists will say that they reject religion whilst at the same time creating their own religion. It even has its own creation story, starting with the miracle of the Big Bang. And it has its own value structure with scientific rationalism and personal freedom sitting atop. And then the Abrahamic religions have their own explanations, same with Eastern philosophies and religions, etc. I happen to think that the Christian worldview is not only true, but definitely, definitely the most conducive to a healthy society. And if you disagree with me, then I've got a question for you. Which of the major cultural issues that we are facing today could not be solved 
by following the teachings of the Bible. Which of the dilemmas that we currently have, have we not already known for a thousand years? And I mean following the Bible in its truest sense, by the way. Genuinely curious to read your answers below. Now let's watch a pretty hilarious and pretty brutal back and forth where it gets very personal at times, but like a car crash, you can't take your eyes off it. Um, today, we've got viewers gathered from all across the world tuning in to a debate between me and Milo, where Milo is going to argue that we should turn the USA into an isolated, authoritarian, zealously religious country. I think that technology, it's the Pandora's box that has changed this country and this world forever, and I don't think we're ever going back to the days of public squares and mail service by horse. Cultural, cultural exchange is happening, whether you like it or not, quite literally at the speed of light. Even right now, potentially hundreds of thousands or even millions of people around the world are listening to me and Milo have this debate. The only way to, type this, to stop this type of cultural exchange is through the militant authoritarianism that Milo is talking about on this stage. That might be through his being against the First Amendment, that might be against his taking away of the Second Amendment, and that might be through the institution of a state religion. This means the destruction of our freedom of speech, our ability to produce media, satire, and comedy, and our ability to communicate openly on the social media platforms we've all unfortunately grown addicted to. <clears throat> After Milo gets his way and abolishes the First Amendment, is he going to be the one deciding who we can or cannot make fun of on Twitter? Is the world really going to return to how it was before, before birth control, before women had the right to work, before, before gay people were allowed to get married, before we were allowed the ability to freely worship whatever God we wanted or abstain from worship altogether? I reckon that we cannot close Pandora's box. Christian nationalism, as it stands today, isn't even a coherent ideology. Its proponents will argue whether there's an ethnic component, whether one needs to be Catholic or not, and whether one needs to even be a Christian or a supporter at all in order to idolize uh, somebody for a Christian nationalist ideology. How many more porn stars does Donald Trump need to work his way through behind his wife's back before Christian nationalists stop worshiping him as their savior? As small as Christian nationalism is as a movement, even with it being as small as it is, there is still endless infighting. Anyone who's taken a gander recently at Milo, Ali Alexander, or Fuentes' Telegram account can attest to that. And now, with an already fractured and fighting minority movement, some want to put even more restrictions, such as race, lineage, sex sexuality, LGBT status, or geography, on who ought to be allowed to join their movement. The glory days of Christianity are largely over. While the number of worshipers have ebbed and flowed through time, it's impossible for us to return to where we came from. In 1999, almost 70% of Americans were part of a church, synagogue, or mosque. And just 20 years later, in 2020, according to Pew Research, that number has fallen to just 47%, a minority of the population for the first time in US history. We need to be realistic about the coming years. We need to help our young men and women find purpose in the world and stop pretending like some Christian nationalism is the answer. We need to find ways to get our young people engaged with their friends, family, and their communities in ways that synergize with the technological explosion the entire world has experienced. If Christian nationalists want to continue to practice Christianity in America, then I say we let them. However, we should never allow them to take away our right not to do the same. If the movement, uh, such as it is, I didn't realize there was one, but um, if, if Christian nationalism is not yet adequately defined, it's because nobody used it before two years ago. Um, which it seems to me to be perfectly reasonable. Trump is not a religious leader in any sense, and you're making a classic mistake of people who don't understand religion, don't understand God, and don't understand their own country when you say, uh, hold Trump up as a kind of moral example. Render unto Caesar. We don't expect that our presidents should be like Jesus because they're not here to do Jesus's job. Um, so, no. Um, it's interesting you talk about women's rights. I mean, Christianity is the... Sorry, I mean... <laughs> You know, I just don't know how hard to go in, really. I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about the religion that gave women uh, consent in marriage. You're talking about the religion that gave women the right to say no, that elevated them from chattel into human beings. You want to return women to chattel. You want women to be like your wife, passed around town. I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm not going to take moral lectures on the rights of women from somebody who treats their, supposedly, their wife in what ought to be a holy sacrament as a communal sex toy. Give me a break. Give me a break. I'm not going to take moral lectures from somebody who, for all intents and purposes, may as well have a fleshlight instead of a wife, who demeans and besmirches her honor who speaks about a woman who should be treated with the reverence and respect and love that we treat our own mothers with, like she was something you could buy, like she's something that just, just to get off with. 
passed around to other men while you watch, flicking yourself off. So forgive me if I decline to take any lectures from you on women's bloody rights. As for gay rights, no thanks. <laughs> I didn't want them when I was having sex with men and I don't want them now. Catholicism and Islam are growing, in case you aren't familiar with the world outside these borders. And the reason for that is that everybody sees what a bloody mess we're all in, thanks to globalization, thanks to the information economy, thanks to the kinds of changes that he says are inexorable because, like a lot of undereducated people, he doesn't have much of a grasp of the world before he was born. I think if you were to uh, glance a little further back, whether it were to ancient Greece or Rome, or the Holy Roman Empire, you would see plenty of examples in history, or even, dare I say it, the Weimar Republic. A little bit closer to our own era, in which an era of rampant sexual degeneracy was indeed replaced by some quite stern social rules, to put it mildly. History is replete with examples of uh, what happens when the public gets sick of people like you fucking everything up, breaking everything apart, and destroying all the things that make society precious, that make relationships work? In fact, if you are to look back in history as far as Greece and Rome, you might say that history is really the story of how people like you, given undue influence and larger platforms than they deserve, um, continually express views that are so far outside of the mainstream and so out of step with what ordinary people think that you have to be regularly slaughtered and new governments have to be installed and coups have to be uh, 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 engaged in just to keep people like you in line because otherwise we'd all be dead. So I'm sorry, but I'm, not, I'm certainly not gonna take any kind of moral lectures from you on anything, but I've given you a few examples of why everything you just said is complete and absolute nonsense, but let me tell you, um, if your memory stretches back, uh, and as your university, you're an educated person, it should be further than 1980. Uh, yeah, you absolutely can put it back in the box, and we must, and we should, because otherwise America is done. Absolutely brutal. Now, this is the first time we've seen Milo in a public debate in years, and I personally savoured every moment of it because obviously he's the goat. I yearn for the days of old, for 2015 and 16, where Milo was going around to college campuses wearing these flamboyantly gay outfits of him as like a gay police officer and proclaiming the truth about feminism being cancer and calling Trump daddy. Never ever before has anybody managed to make college liberals actually malfunction and spontaneously combust like the Milo of old. And guys, I know that personal attacks are not exactly where we want to be going during a debate, but I will say the following. I do appreciate both of these gentlemen's ability to be able to give and receive. Sorry, low hanging fruit, but I had to. As for the more sophisticated points, I think it's clear here that Milo is steamrolling Destiny. He's putting forward sociological and historical arguments, and they're very convincing, whilst Destiny keeps on building straw men. He claims that Trump is the saviour of Christian nationalists. That is flat out wrong. Their saviour is Christ. And the Bible clearly lays this idea out, as Milo mentioned. Matthew 22, 21 is a story where Jesus is asked if the Jews should pay taxes to the Romans, to which he responds, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Caesar, in this case, being the earthly authority that governs you. That quote there is such a masterful summation of the relationship that Christians should have with earthly authorities, rendering unto them what is theirs, such as taxes and worldly authority, whilst rendering unto God what is God, such as worship. Worshipping Trump would make him an idol, which is a sin. And now onto the next part where they discuss a little bit about what Christian nationalism would actually look like in practice in the real world. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to respond to. Um, I think it's a little funny that um, apparently I am so far outside of what people regularly think, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure I'm giving you a bigger audience than you've had in the past several years post your cancellation. <laughs> Um, but I see that um, this is this is what the uh, this is what the dying this is what the uh, dying throes I guess of an internet provocateur as he self-described himself back when you were writing on the alt right and when you were writing on Trump now when you I guess you're not writing on guys anymore because apparently you prayed away the gay so whatever you're doing now 
Um, but I won't get into all that. I will, uh, I'll take the high road, despite the fact that <clears throat> you're one of the most obsessed with my wife's vagina gay guys I've ever seen in my entire life, which is very fucking weird, but um, very strange. I mean, the society that I advocate for is the one that exists today where people are allowed to worship whatever religion they want. I think that right now, America is superior to a Christian nationalist version of it because if two different people decide they want to worship two different versions of Christianity, they have the right to do that. Obviously, in Milo's world, I guess the non-Catholics even, I think, would get killed. I don't know how many, where the, the killing what starts the and stops um, for his version of Christian nationalism Who's or ethnically, anybody? I don't know where that starts or stops. 40 minutes is a terribly long time to do a line of coke. I was late because I was. I was late. I was late for the ordinary reasons that people are late. I was at the hairdresser. All right, Destiny. You know, I have the personality I have. I'm sort of stuck with it now. Um, now your question, Destiny. Uh, you have five minutes to respond to this, and then I'll have three minutes to respond to that. Some would argue that a society without religion at its core would devolve into a nihilistic society, deprived of any meaning or purpose. How would you prevent in your society, non-Christian nationalist governing society from devolving into a nihilistic, meaningless society? I think that you have to have something greater than yourself to live for. And I think religion is like a really easy package to give somebody that kind of solves for a lot of those problems. Um, it gives you a nice guide for how to view the world. It gives you a nice guide for how to view your family. It gives you a nice guide for how to live an ethical life. And through that package, people feel like they have something greater than themselves to live for. I don't think it's impossible to have that thing without religion. But I think right now we're very politically fractured as a country, and it makes it really difficult for us to have those things. Um, so for instance, there are certain topics that are hotly contested that I don't think should be. So for instance, all of us should be able to say we're proud to be Americans. That includes progressives, that includes BLM people, that includes people on the left, that includes anybody that might, you know, however far left you go, you should be able to say that. That shouldn't be ground that we cede uh, to, to people on the right. I think it's kind of a shame that if you see an American flag on somebody's car today, you basically know that they're a conservative because nobody on the left would put that on their car. I think that's an insane proposition. So I think that when we've gotten to this point to where we're so politically divided that people can't even feel proud of their country anymore, if you also take away religion from those people too, then they're kind of aimlessly, I guess, wandering from Twitter to Facebook to YouTube to whatever, just endlessly shitting on each other with no common united purpose. So I think that one of the things we need to work on more than anything else is, is kind of healing some of the political fracture that exists in this country. I think it's good that we argue with each other, um, but it's not good that we are relentlessly banning people from every platform so that we're all kind of like gathering in different areas and we're not even able to have conversations with each other in the same reality anymore. Isn't endlessly careening from one person to the other, shitting on each other, um, what you do for a living, for lemons, for handouts. Um, there, there aren't good societies unless people um, agree on a common set of values. And I'm afraid that freedom, democracy, and the American dream haven't cut it, have they? You don't need to really be a Christian. I'm certainly not going to attempt to persuade anybody this evening. I'm not in the business of evangelization. I quite like that about Judaism, actually. It's like, no, we don't want you. Uh, but that's not, that's not the Christian way. So. But um, just look at the societies that Christians build. I mean, earlier he says, oh, you know, you get rid of, uh, get rid of the First Amendment, and there goes satire. Again, apparently a memory that doesn't stretch back before 1980. Because I think most of the best satirists were Christian Europeans, weren't they? And before that, they were pagans. And, you know, we live in a very Hellenistic kind of a inheritance. And it was just, just complete and total bollocks. Um, and you've been doing a lot of complete and total bollocks, assigning positions to me that I don't hold. And uh, saying, oh, he wants to murder everyone. He wants to kill all the blacks. Um, no. No. Um, look at the societies that Christians build. Look at the things they build. In Catholic theology, um, there's a thing called the transcendentals, and it, it's uh, supposedly um, the things that all souls have in common, that all uh, people yearn for, and which brings us closer to an understanding of God. Uh, now, opinions differ on how many of these things there are, but the, the core three that everyone agrees on is beauty, truth, and goodness. And it seems to me that if you look at the frescoes in Italy, or you listen to German composers, or look at Dutch painting, that we in Western Christian Europe have done a pretty good job of embracing beauty, truth, and goodness, and also self-sacrifice and sacrifice for love, which is the central image of Christianity.
uh, Feuerbach, the philosopher who was not a Christian, um, did not like Christians at all, said that you know um, you can sort of tell uh, what a culture is all about from its its religion's kind of central symbol. Ours is Christ on the cross, dying for someone you love. It's Tristan and Isolde. It's all the things that we think are most noble. It's sending people to war to die for their country. All of those values, all those things we love, rest on the image of Christ on the cross. We are good only because we have learned goodness from Christianity. And we can insist in a prideful way that, oh, no, no, I'm good because I made myself good, because I got there through reason. All right, mate. Just look at the societies that Christians build, and you tell me where you want to live. Is it Abu Dhabi? Is it the Congo? Is it Sparta? Or is it Western Europe, maybe 50 years ago? I know where I'd rather be. I mean, it's very, very hard to argue with that, guys. I know where I'd rather be. And if there's one thing that I will say about Milo, as hilarious and charismatic and entertaining as he is, my favorite part about him is actually how much of a talented wordsmith he is. He has the ability to turn a phrase like few others, and it really reminds us of just what it is that we are missing through our societal conditioning. And all of the things that we just accept as normal and as truth that in reality, we should be resisting. When I hear him speak about the essence of what truth, goodness, and beauty really means, it elicits a visceral reaction in me and it reminds me of just how far we've fallen now on to the last part and i don't think that anyone in this room can honestly say that america is better now than it was when most people were going to church or at least god fearing it isn't better and you don't have to be a christian to participate in a christian society christians are the best of all at letting people in, sometimes too much. Sometimes the people that come in end up messing everything up. You don't have to be a Christian to benefit from a Christian society, and lots of people in this room have done exactly that. Uh, but when you take God out and, and you know, things start to fall apart, you end up in a world nobody wants to live in. What and we are in. Sorry? What do you mean? Oh, well, I mean, if I had my way, I'd go back to about 1,200. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, lots of, lo lo I mean, uh, lots of propagandists in university departments call it the Dark Ages. Um, you know, well, this is a conversation for another day, really, but um, it seems to me it was uh, quite, quite a nice time to live. And uh, I think that you would find, if you care about this kind of thing, if you do care about things above and beyond yourself, if you care about where we go afterwards, if you care about leaving a good legacy, if you care about being good to the people around you. I think a lot more people in 1400 got into heaven each year than do now. And I don't think you have to be a Christian to accept that that's because we're not nice anymore and we're not good to each other. And the reason for that is the failing moral architecture and underpinning of society, which was required by the founders or this stuff doesn't function and it's not. I think the important thing is for people to have something bigger than themselves to live for. I don't think it has to be religion, but if it was religion, I don't necessarily think that's the worst thing in the world. I think that the defining aspect of the United States is that a lot of people with contradictory ideas can exist within the same geographic borders, governed by the same legal system, voting on the same politicians, and somehow finding a way to make all of that work. I think we've done it for hundreds of years. I think we do it better than any other country on the planet. Right now, today, not before 1980, not in the 1200s, but today in 2023, I think we have an incredibly diverse country of people, all sorts of creeds, all sorts of ethnicities, all sorts of different types of people that seem to be living together and making it work. I think we have problems right now, like I mentioned earlier, with the political division. And I think that that's a real problem that we need to combat, but I think we need to do it by having honest conversations about what we can do to move forward, not by talking to people that want to look back hundreds or thousands of years to what society used to look like before there was Gucci and hairdressers. Um, it's true that when God moves out, that um, other things move in. You don't just kind of get rid of it and now everyone's happy and now everyone can just be nice to each other. Um, th that yearning that you've acknowledged that we all have has got to be satisfied by something. So if you take the Christian God out, something worse moves in because there isn't anything better than that. There isn't anything uh, better than that for organizing society. There isn't anything better than that for teaching people how to behave to one another. There isn't anything better than that uh, objectively, practically, and 
empirically. So um, things do move in, but progressivism of the type that he likes doesn't function like a religion because all religions have one thing in common that his political orthodoxy doesn't, and that's salvation and forgiveness because there is no forgiveness for uh, people who are canceled, um, whether or not they were responsible for what happened to them and were trying to make sense of an abuse experience or whether they said something that they shouldn't have said. There's no, back, there's no way back, there's no, there's no forgiveness, there's no redemption. And that's the thing all religions, except for this orthodoxy, seem to have in common. So I don't think it's, I think it's a bit lazy to say that um, one religion gets replaced by another. But it is definitely true that um, you cannot simply chop off the top of the pyramid and expect everything to be fine. Something worse will slither its way up there. And it has. So I think anybody with two eyes could see that that's a very accurate observation. The top of the pyramid has indeed been chopped off, and something very slimy and grotesque has slithered its way up to the top indeed. But I enjoyed seeing Milo back debating, and I really hope he does more of it. And he strikes me as a far more tortured soul than his old persona. I think he's had to deal with some personal traumas within his own life that he was avoiding, and it must have been very difficult for him. So I commend him for that. You can see his maturation and his personal development through the age in his eyes, and I actually do believe that Milo will be back at some point and he will have some sort of a public persona again. But hopefully next time in a much more profound and mature way. We're yet to see. So with that, I'm looking forward to obviously reading all of your thoughts on that one. And if you guys would like to find me at my links below, reach out and send me some angry messages about how I have no idea what I'm talking about, then feel free. You can hit those links below. And if you'd like to watch another video, including Milo Yiannopoulos predicting everything, I'll leave that here. And another random one here. I don't know what it's going to be. But until next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.